Now, so far we've been talking about, really, the advent of the welfare state, something that was envisioned by Woodrow Wilson, began to be put into place by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the New Deal, but really was brought to something, well, not quite to its current state, but nevertheless the foundations of it were really laid and much of the edifice constructed by Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. Now, what justifies it? What was remarkable by the late 1960s is that although the United States and increasingly Western European countries were turning into this sort of democratic welfare state, um, there was really no philosophical justification for it. There was a kind of political theory that underlaid, um, you might say, a traditional American pattern, a minimal state that really just tried to protect people from harm. That was easy to find justification for in John Locke, in James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson. They were really the theorists of that conception of government. Government is there really primarily to keep people from hurting you. Then there was the Rousseau and Marx conception, a top-down conception, and it was easy to see that as a justification for socialism, for communism, for perhaps certain kinds of progressivism, like Wilson's maybe. But the democratic welfare state, as it emerged in the late 60s um, throughout Europe and the United States, what was the justification for it? Now, there really wasn't one, in a sense. I remember actually <laughs> deciding in the early 80s to team teach a course on political philosophy with a colleague, and he was actually astounded to find that, at least up until roughly 1970, there wasn't any theory of this. You could construct one maybe on this foundation, or maybe on that foundation, but nobody had really done it in any very systematic way. So what was its justification? Exactly that kind of justification was offered by John Rawls in his 1971 book, A Theory of Justice, and then elaborated in later writings. So Rawls is an important, perhaps the most important, American political philosopher, and I'm tempted to say just outright political philosopher of the last century. He has a conception of justice as fairness. And he argues really on the basis of social contract theory. He goes back to Hobbes, to Locke, to Rousseau, and says, I want to revive that tradition of social contract, but I want to revive it in a version that actually justifies the welfare state. So he argues that the principles of social justice are those that people would choose under a certain kind of ideal condition. That free, rational, self-interested, and equal parties would accept to govern their association. So here's the image. We're going to set up a society. And in fact, let's imagine that this happens. Some disaster strikes Austin, and only this classroom survives. And so it's up to us to reconstitute the new society. Okay? So our job is to figure out what rules are going to govern our new association. Or maybe like, actually this happens in a Simpson episode, where the kids go on a field trip and the school bus ends up falling off a bridge, and they end up on a desert island, and it's kind of a Lord of the Flies scenario. But anyway, luckily they were all members of the Model UN Club, so <laughs> Lisa started telling them what they were out to do, and well, hilarity ensues. But now imagine that happens to us, right? We take a field trip, we're on a desert island, suddenly we have to constitute the rules of our new society. How should we do it? Well, Rawl says we should do it fairly. And what does it mean to do it fairly? First of all, well, we should all be free, okay? It's not gonna be a fair outcome if some of us are coercing others. Suppose I say, all right, here are the rules I'm in favor of, you're in favor of them too, right? And I start going around beating up people until they agree then that's not fair. That's something that involves coercion. I'm forcing people into this. So we want people to free, freely choose what they want. We want those people to be rational. We don't want us all to be there on the desert island and only confronting this when we're so hungry we can't even think. So like, I don't know, what rules? Just food, food, whatever, food, food. Okay, we want to be able to act rationally. We want to imagine these people being self-interested. Why self-interested? This actually is very important. The idea is not to impose some moral conception on people. After all, some parties might agree with that moral conception, some might not. His idea is, imagine that we're all just looking out for ourselves. So the idea is, I want to voluntarily put myself under these constraints. I want to voluntarily set up a system of government with these kinds of institutions and these kinds of laws, and I will submit to it because it's in my own interest to do it. Rawls here is really addressing the problem of normativity. 
that we started this course out with, right? How do you get from is to ought? How do you get, in this case, from factual descriptive statements to something like a conception of justice? And his answer is, do it on the basis of rationality. Do it on the basis of self-interest. Think, what would I, as a reasonable, free, self-interested person, choose? What would be best for me? Answer is, it would be best for me to live under a certain kind of government. Not only government, as Hobbes says, but a specific set of institutions and rules. And we want everybody to be equal. It won't be fair if you all simply say, under my guidance, well, I am the professor, so you should do what I say. <laughs> right? It shouldn't be like that. We don't want anybody to be naturally a ruler or naturally ruled. So these are things that we would all agree to freely, voluntarily, rationally, and they would be in our own self-interest. Well, this is really just the general idea of social contract theory. Remember, we had contrasted the state of nature without government to a condition of government. And the question of the social contract theorist is, what would you choose? The answer is supposed to be, well, you'd choose government. But also, really, if that's the answer, then, well, what kind of government? What rules are you agreeing to? And that's what Rawls wants to pin down carefully. Now, there are lots of objections you can raise to social contract theory. You can say, why this hypothetical ideal circumstance? Why don't people's real historical circumstances matter? Um, why do we imagine people like us who are perfectly free and all of that? Well, it's because that would be fair. So there is some normative element already built in. But Rawls says, look, I want to consider, by the way, I'm getting the impression that this is utterly boring you to tears. Why is this so boring? Maybe it, I'll, I'll warn you, however boring my talking about it might be, reading Rawls is worse. <laughs> <laughs> Hint for the final exam. If there's a quote that you find hard to understand, and it's hard to understand partly because you're too bored to finish the sentence, it's probably Rawls. <laughs> uh, now, I think he's a great thinker. I don't really mean to make fun of him. I, I, I have a lot of respect for John Rawls and think he's brilliant. But he really could have used a ghostwriter. <laughs> I mean, he can take a deep philosophical idea and make it sound unbelievably dull. There are other people, like his enemy, Robert Nozick, will soon consider, his colleague at Harvard, who had a very different idea. Nozick can take actually a very simple idea and make it seem dramatically new and exciting and like, wow, never, nobody ever thought of that. But Rawls can take something that really is dramatic and exciting, and nobody ever thought of that, and make you think, oh, what set of institutions would free, rational, self-interested people elect in an idealized circumstance? It's like, oh, stop, stop. <laughs> so anyway, it is like that, but it's, the ideas are cool, even if the expression of them is not, either his expression or my expression. Here's his question, really. We want to say, what principles would we actually choose? We're going to set up rules to be governed by. We're going to set up institutions. What institutions would they be? What rules would they be? How would we go about choosing them? Well, what rules would govern our association? He says there are two things we have to specify about this ideal circumstance of choice. One is that it would be a situation of knowledge, OK? In what he refers to as the original position this idealized hypothetical circumstance. We're all in the desert island coming up with the rules that will govern our political association. First of all, we have to know what we're doing. We have to know the relevant facts about politics, about society, about economics, and so on. So we want to actually understand people individually and in groups. We don't want to make stupid choices based on just ignorance of the facts, ignorance of how people work together and individually. However, he says, we also have to act under a veil of ignorance. There's something very important that I'm not allowed to know, which is where I fit into the whole scheme. I'm not allowed to know my place in society, my natural abilities even, my propensities, my tendencies, my conception of the good even. Now, why? If I do, I'm going to be setting things up to my advantage in a way that might be unfair. And by the way, you could... Well, a lot of people have disagreed with this constraint and have thought either that it's too strong and now I have no basis to choose at all, or that I don't really need to exclude this. We can have our, our particular perspectives and then just negotiate about it. But his concern is to say, look, if I know that I'm a philosophy professor in this society that we're constructing, then I can set things up to be to the advantage of philosophy professors, right? If you know that you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to try to set things up so they're to the advantage of lawyers. If you know you're going to be a musician, 
you're going to think, well, I want heavy subsidies for music and the arts and so on. You want to set it up so that it's advantageous to you, et cetera, et cetera. And Rawls says, look, I don't want you to bring that to the table. And in fact, he says this, imagine you've got a client who you're choosing on behalf of. It's not you who's going to be a member of this society. It's somebody else. Someone else has hired you to represent them. The thing is, you don't know much about this person. They've said, please represent me and represent my interests. Do something that will be good for me. And you say, well, tell me about yourself. And they never respond. And there you are having to set things up. You don't know anything about the person you're representing. He says, that gives you a conception of what it would be like to choose. You choose on the basis of things that are general human wants and human interests, not on the basis of specific things. Partly in the background here is Kant's enlightenment idea that our choice really ought to be driven by universal considerations and not by what Kant called subjective particular determinations. And so the idea is we want everyone to be equal, and we don't want contingencies, preferences, merely subjective things to affect the choice. Well, it's very important in the choice of principle that everyone cooperate and that everyone agree. The decision has to be unanimous because it's important that everyone feel that they're benefiting from the arrangement. And here he's following Rousseau. And I think he thinks this for the same reason that Rousseau does. If you don't agree to the social contract, then first of all, you're not actually part of the society. We haven't succeeded in our goal. But also, the laws are now inapplicable to you, in a sense, right? I can't justly enforce them. The whole idea is to explain how government authority can be legitimate. But if you don't opt in, then it seems like I have no basis for actually enforcing the law and subjecting you to government's authority. Well, what would we choose? Let's finally get to the decision. <laughs> he says, here are the principles of justice we would choose. First of all, I would want to be part of the group deciding on the rules in the future. After all, we might come up with general institutions, general rules, but there are going to be a lot of more specific decisions about rules, about laws, about institutions that we'll have to make. I want to be a party to those. So the first thing I'll say is that everybody has to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty, compatible with a similar, similar liberty for others. So this is often considered a principle of maximal equal basic liberties. Now, what are those basic liberties? Those that are involved in making decisions. So political activity, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, also the right to own property, the rule of law, all of those things are fundamental to just establishing a political order and having us continue to be part of the decision-making process. In other words, I am not, as Hobbes thinks, going to be able to sign everything away to a king. Am I going to do that? Am I going to say, let there be a king, I will do whatever that person says? No, I'm going to want to maintain my hand in helping to shape the way this society develops. But the second principle is the one that has to do with economics, and that is really the crucial one for justifying the welfare state. The first principle justifies the democratic part of the democratic welfare state. This justifies the welfare part. Social and economic inequalities must be arranged so that they are, well, meeting two constraints. The first is called the difference principle. They, the differences must be reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage. And in particular, that's going to be the advantage of those at the bottom rungs of society, the least advantaged. So we will want to set things up so that the least advantaged in our society are as well off as possible. The poor will always be with you, but we want the poor to be as well off as we can make. Okay? And then secondly, equal opportunity. These differences must be attached to positions and offices open to all. So the second constraint rules out discrimination. We can't discriminate against people on the basis of irrelevant factors. Now, that's not to say we have to decide everything by lottery. If we're going to ha hire philosophy professors, for example, certain things are going to be relevant to doing a good job as a philosophy professor, and other things will be irrelevant. What are some things that are relevant? Your speech. OK, how well you can speak. Yeah, what are some other things that are relevant? Knowledge of philosophy. Your knowledge of philosophy. What else? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's actually hard to say maybe what qualifies somebody for being a philosophy professor. Um, we tend to think, yeah, related to the knowledge, you have to have a PhD. Um, relative to other things, you have to be an effective speaker and an effective writer and a good thinker and so forth and so on. Um, I will admit that when I was, I mean, I've been on many search committees the last few years. There was one candidate that some other people were enthusiastic about that I didn't like because his handshake 
was creepy. It was like shaking Harry Potter's hand after Gilderoy Lockhart had destroyed the bones in his hand. It was just kind of this flabby, cold thing. It was like, oh. Right? The person's just walking into the room for an hour-long interview, and you shake his hand, and you think, like, oh. <laughs> it's like Gumby. Uh, and, and now, is that relevant? Well, you know, my other department member said, no, look, that's not relevant. Don't, don't, that shouldn't affect you. But I couldn't actually make it stop affecting me. Now, my justification for that was, look, this guy can't relate to other people. And it wasn't, that wasn't the only aspect of it. I mean, I've gotten to know him over the years, and he's very smart, and he really can't relate well to other people. Um, so maybe there are certain interpersonal things like that. But now, what are some things that are, uh, well, things like that, in other words, that are kind of vague, and you're not quite sure how to classify them. But what are some things that are clearly irrelevant? Your taste in music. Taste in music, right. Person walks in and I say, so what kind of music do you like? And he says, I hate Baroque music. I'll tell you that. I'm going to say, out of here. Now that would be a reasonable thing if I'm hiring somebody as a store of Baroque music, right? And they say they hate it. <laughs> then that's relevant. But for a philosophy professor, that's not relevant. What are some other things that would be irrelevant? Race. Race. Race, good. Race would be irrelevant. So that shouldn't be a factor. What are some other things that shouldn't be factors? Religion. Good, income. Yeah, how, how rich is this person? That shouldn't matter. Religion. Religion, that shouldn't matter. Your looks. Your looks, exactly. That shouldn't matter. In fact, actually, studies show that if there's any kind of discrimination that actually does have a huge impact on society, it's that. People like to be around good-looking people. And so, yeah, what can I say? We're all advantaged by that, but there are poor people out there who... <laughs> well, anyway, yeah. Um, but so this one I think we have a pretty good intuitive grasp of, but what about this one? So we've got to arrange inequality so that the people at the bottom of the ladder are as well off as possible. And that he takes to justify various programs that transfer income, that establish opportunities, that in general try to help people at the bottom levels of society. Next time we will consider some other, you might say, more metaphysical debates that occur in the late 60s and early 70s.